Welcome back to Soteriology 101. As you can see, we have a guest with us today. Many of you have been following along as we've listened to Dr. James White on the Dividing Line program because he's taken it upon himself uh, to repeatedly attack, and I don't think the word attack is overstating. I think attack is probably a good word there, but he has attacked Dr. Ken Wilson's Oxford uh, thesis, and uh, really he actually started on the more simplified layman's summary, the foundation of Augustinian Calvinism. And uh, Dr. Wilson was uh, kind enough to write that book uh, based upon our request at Soteriology 101. I, I mentioned to him that it was kind of hard for uh, the average layman to digest this um, and that maybe uh, he would consider writing a more, uh, more of a summary. And that's exactly what he did. And I appreciate uh, him doing that. But uh, White has now dedicated over 15 hours from what we counted uh, trying to refute Dr. Wilson, and he's used ad hominem, he's used straw man arguments, rhetorical arguments. Uh, on occasion, he has uh, used some facts. And so I've asked Dr. Wilson uh, to return here to Sociology 101 and to speak uh, about some of these criticisms. So Dr. Wilson, thank you for taking the time to return to speak with us. I appreciate you being here. Uh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure, Leighton. Well, have you had the opportunity to listen all, to all of Dr. White's rebuttals uh, so far and the, even read uh, his, his material online? I have listened to it all, Layton. <laughs> and uh, for, first of all, I'd like to applaud White on having Athanasius as his favorite early church father. I've told my students for years that Athanasius is my personal hero. Uh, my African-American students love it because Athanasius was a black man from Africa. Um, I also like White's understanding of what's happening with COVID-19. Uh, he implied it, but I'll just state it plainly. There's some evidence that this pandemic is an attempt to create a one world government through a worldwide catastrophe. Um, and as a medical doctor with personal risk factors, uh, including age, I can tell you, yes, we must be cautious with this pandemic. But there is definitely overreaction to the pandemic for what I think are political reasons. So I think White and I would agree on many things. I think a lot of people forget that we, we have a lot more in common than sometimes we, we think when it comes to uh, our Christian brothers, even those who disagree with us over sociological differences. And so I'm sure there's probably a lot more about Dr. White uh, that we would agree with than people may recognize in, in these kinds of back and forth discussions. So I appreciate you pointing that out. So here's what I'm going to do. I, I've cobbled together some clips uh, what, I, what I've tried to do is kind of group together the clips that are similar, maybe in their, um, in their mode <laughs> or, or in their uh, fallacious nature, if you will. And so um, I'm going to ask you to respond after we just play these clips. And then this one, he's holding up your summary book, The Foundation of Augustinian Calvinism. And that's kind of where he starts his critique. And so let's, let's play that one first. I must seek to be as gracious as I possibly can be. I am, however, stunned that this work was granted anything at Oxford at all. The direct connection established, and you can't, you can't go, well, you can't review that book. That's actually, that doesn't really represent the other book. Well, actually, it, it does. Okay, it seems like here... Dr. Wilson, White's either confused or he's just plain out misrepresenting your work. It, it wasn't your summary book that received the doctoral thesis, right? Correct. Uh, my thesis was read by three world experts in ancient religions for my doctorate, and then another three different world experts for publication by Morzebeck, the publisher of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So Morzebeck is one of the most prestigious religious publishers in the world, from my understanding. Yes, it is. So they don't just publish anything, I, I would take it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and that, that, well, that takes me to his comments about Oxford. Um, he seems to, and I hate that he did this, but he seems to kind of treat Oxford as substandard because, well, he doesn't, he doesn't agree with your thesis. So I guess that means Oxford just is not a, a, a reputable university anymore, I guess. <laughs> uh, right. So first I tell my students, Truth is truth. It really makes no difference where the president of the seminary or the janitor says it. Truth is truth. So let's start there. But second, Oxford has been at the top three universities in the world for theological education for decades, uh, centuries, actually. Um, in contrast, 
I'd never heard of White's alma mater, Columbia Theological Seminary. Um, I had to Google it to find out it's not even accredited and it's all online. So if White wants to take Oxford down a notch, uh, we can give that to him. But if we do, then I think he must give up his non-accredited online doctorate. Yeah, and, and this is one of the reasons I've pointed out that and you keep putting, I mean, we, we talk about what ad hominem is, um, and the way that I pointed it out is I always ask, okay, if somebody more qualified made the exact same argument, how would you answer the argument? Because it seems like what ad hominem is doing is trying to avoid answering the argument. Instead, I focus upon the person. It's much easier to focus on someone like little old Leighton Flowers than it is an Oxford graduate. Uh, and, and so I, I understand why he might rather uh, aim his critiques at me than at you. But, um, but, but that's the whole point is that when you're starting to focus upon side issues like that, it just becomes distracting. And so it, it's obvious that he hasn't read your entire thesis yet. At least maybe uh, he's working on it. It's looked like there uh, these last few responses that he's actually getting to the thesis portion of it. Um, but he, when he first started, he seemed to just completely ignore the, the, the preface in your, uh, the foundation of Augustinian Calvinism. And so I wanted to read it, uh, just for everybody to hear what he apparently missed. Um, it says this, it says, quote, this abbreviated book is inadequate for critical evaluation in a scholarly study. Now stop real quick. That doesn't mean that it's inadequate for anything or that it's trash or that nobody should want it or anything like that, like you heard Huck say. Okay, it's just he, what, what the qualification is. This is inadequate for critical evaluation in a scholarly study. A critique or review of this simplified book by any scholar should not be considered a scholarly response unless he or she has previously publicly reviewed my complete scholarly book in a peer-reviewed journal or book. I find it necessary to explicitly state this because many persons, even scholars, may be tempted to dismiss the conclusions for personal reasons and avoid, even unconsciously, legitimately researching Augustine's conversion to determinism, end quote. <laughs> so, Dr. Wilson, it sounds like you're a little bit of a prophet in this one because it seems like that's exactly what White did. It's like he, he, he did exactly what you were anticipating when you wrote this paragraph, and he, he attacks the simplified version as being, quote-unquote, non-scholarly, and maybe he just didn't even read the preface of your, of your book. I don't know, Layden. Um, White complained that the thesis book was too expensive, uh, so I sent him a copy at my own expense. I, I don't receive any money from any of my books. Um, and in his programs, he shows that copy that I sent him, uh, but he only pokes at it here and there without telling the whole story. Um, he leaves out all of the evidence against his deterministic view as I cite scholars. So I also noticed that he, he commits a lot of just basic information errors. Um, and so I put together a few clips uh, with that. So let's look at some of those. Determine what you see and what you don't see. And the two great battles that Augustine fought, the first part of his ministry, the Donatist controversy a schism and a division in the church. The end of his ministry is focused upon his struggles with Pelagius and all the related political struggles of his ministry, the Pelagian controversy at the end of his ministry. Those are the two major ones. He engaged in all sorts of minor ones too, but those are the ones that really um, took a great deal of his time and effort. All right, so Dr. Wilson, were there only two major battles in Augustine's life as White repeatedly claims throughout many of his broadcasts? No, uh, White does not know some very basic information about Augustine. Uh, Augustine did not have two. He had three major battle periods in his life uh, where he wrote extensively. Uh, White's missed the first one. That's the uh, Manichaean group. So he had the Manichaeans, then he had the Donatists, then he had the Pelagians. So any scholarly text will confirm this. Um, White's repeatedly in error on some very basic information on Augustine. Well, here's uh, something he said about Pelagius, too. I want to play this. Uh, Pelagius really depends upon epistles and letters, and you might say, well, those are, those are helpful. They are, but one thing is for certain, most of the time when we are reading epistles and letters from people, they're, they're brief, 
and very often in, the author is assuming that the reason the person's writing in the first place, they've already read some of the other their books, which may, we may not have anymore. All right, so here, letters and epistles are obviously the, the same thing, and uh, I know here we've talked about a little bit more of Pelagius' writings. So why don't you tell a little, bit, a, little, a little bit more about what else Pelagius has written? Yeah, um, why well, it seems to be ignorant that we have Pelagius' commentary on Romans. Uh, it's even translated into English for us. So I discussed this commentary on Romans in my thesis book, which he keeps holding up, but he doesn't seem to have read it. Okay, let me play this other clip here where it just seems like White doesn't really do his research about the people he's talking about. He's, he's done this with me several times, uh, making accusations about my own personal life and uh, how I spend my time uh, apart from here, Sociology 101, and seems to do the same with you. He just assumes something about you based upon where you work and those kinds of things. And so let's play this clip here. You guys are teaching things that sound a lot like what Pelagius taught, therefore they're Pelagian. Or they're now, I, I just, we know what Leighton's complaining about here. Um, but did you catch the, the, the groups he put together there? There was, there was one part there that I, I wanted to catch. Did you catch he said the grace guys? Do you know who they are? Because remember, Wilson teaches for a seminary that is that was marked by anti lordship, no repentance, um, and they call themselves the Grace Guys or, or you know, free grace. We call it cheap grace, but anyway. Um, so he's there. There, the provisionists are are making allies out there, which would require them, I guess, to be friendly toward the idea that, yeah, repentance is not uh, actually a requirement of salvation. I'm, I'm wondering um, how that fits. There's a lot of Southern Baptists that buy that stuff, so I, you know. <laughs> okay, so, um, so are you and your school anti-lordship, and do you reject repentance, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Wilson? <laughs> um, white is wrong. Uh, I am a lordship sanctificationist. White is a lordship justificationist. I am not anti-lordship. Uh, white misrepresents my position. And he also deliberately misrepresents the school's doctrinal statement about repentance. Um, we believe repentance is necessary. So I read the Gray School of Theology doctrine statement. It's available on the website online. A quote, we believe that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and should seek redemption and harmonious relationship with God through confession, repentance, baptism, and faith in Jesus Christ. End of quote. So White de de deliberately misrepresents, rep misrepresents me and the school. Wow. Um, in addition, I don't believe everything that all the other professors believe at the school either. Well, now... Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't you kind of help start that school as well? I did, Leighton. Um, I helped start it to provide educational opportunities for um, about half the cost of seminaries and colleges, and especially for underprivileged Hispanic and African-American students in the Houston area. Uh, we're now in over 30 different countries around the world, and we can do that partly because I do not take a salary. I'm an ordained minister and we provide for the poor as scripture commands, including food and clothing, um, per Galatians 2, James 2, et cetera. Well, that's wonderful. Thanks for letting us know more about that. Um, but okay, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, Manichaeanism and the, the Manichaean's interpretation of Christian scriptures, and we're gonna listen to some things White says. And before we listen to this clip, it seems to me at least that White has this premise that if somehow he can demonstrate that Augustine didn't import every aspect of Manichaeanism into Christianity, therefore he couldn't have possibly, it's just absurd to even consider that he might import even one small aspect of Manichaeanism into uh, the Christian church. And he seems to repeat that over and over again. Um, nevertheless, yeah. let's, let's listen to this clip. So can you imagine how Manichees interpret Christian scriptures when you don't have the monotheistic personal God of the Old Testament as the foundation of your interpretation? Yeah. To say that they interpreted it in the same way Reformed people interpret it is 
absurd on a level that's pretty difficult to to conceive that this wasn't caught and someone said ah that's really mixing up categories that's really bad but anyway we'll uh, be illustrating all right so here dr wilson it seems like white claims there's no manichaean interpretation of scripture is that true uh, again white seems to be ignorant of augustine's books contra faustus the manichaean and contra felix the manichaean Augustine specifically discusses their interpretations of biblical passages. Yes, we have Manichaean interpretations of Christian scriptures. So, again, it is an error. All right, let's play the next clip on Manichaeanism from him. One second. The thesis is, well, he takes Manichaean interpretations, Gnostic interpretations, whatever that means. Whatever that means, I have yet to find interpretation. I now have his own book, so maybe there's a whole section on the uh, exegetical methodology of the Manichaeans. I I'll look for that. Um, I don't expect to find it, but you'd have to. What you'd have to do is you'd have to demonstrate that there was a specifically identifiable Manichaean exegetical process. All right, so is that something you would need to prove, a Manichaean exegetical process? Um, this is another logical error. Uh, White does later admit in his program there is no such thing as a Gnostic or a Manichaean exegesis or hermeneutic. So must I do the impossible for him? Um, no, thank you. <laughs> a, a, a scholar only needs to show how Manichaeans interpreted certain Christian scriptures deterministically. And that is done through reading Augustine's anti-Manichaean works. Um, White's never read them, so no, more, no wonder he's out in left field on his, on his claims. Yeah, and th that's what I was referring to in one of my responses when I was talking about even Christosom uh, acknowledges in his homilies on John 644 when he says something to the effect of Manichaeans leap onto this text to prove that men have no power of the will. Um, and so it wasn't just, uh, obviously, Augustine. The, the other church fathers seem to be kind of confronting that. But uh, let's let's play this next clip here. Cyrus, Cyrus was the result of literally hundreds of thousands of free choices of creatures. How did how did God know without a decree? Centuries before the soldiers decided, hey, let's not rip that um, that seamless garment he's got. Let's uh, let's get some money. Let's cast lots for it. Hundreds of years. Millions of free will choices. God's a pretty good guesser, huh? <laughs> so, so God's a, a good guesser. Uh, this is one of the things that is frustrating me. It seems like that um, it, it's one of the two is it's two extremes. It's either God is deterministically and sovereignly decreeing every minute detail, every choice, everything is decreed by God, a meticulous divine determinism, duped, if you will, or it's this extreme other thing where God's just like shocked off his throne or he's wringing his hands or he's just a really good guesser. <laughs> it seems like uh, he, he just, he, he can't focus on our actual view, which is between those two. Um, yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, I agree, Layden. Um, it seems that White's view of God is a puny God. Uh, <laughs> think the Hulk on the Avengers whipping Loki around. You beneath me. I am a God, you dull creature. And I will not be bullied by that. Puny God. Um, White's view of this puny God cannot keep track of millions of free choices. Well, my God is bigger. He can keep track of all of them. Uh, he knows them all before the foundation of the world. God does not need to decree every minuscule detail. Um, sure, God does sometimes intervene in human history, but it is not a constant micromanaging. If we go to Augustine's Stoic background, that was the source of his view of a meticulous micromanaging God that he brought into Christianity. Um, scholars before me have pointed this out. I'm not the first. Um, and they pointed out that the early church fathers appealed to God's foreknowledge of future human choices and applying God's general sovereignty against Stoic meticulous sovereignty. Uh, the Gnostic God must micromanage human responses to God. 
But Irenaeus argued against the Gnostics about 180 CE that the Christian God is bigger. Why? Because he allows for human free choice to respond positively to God. Uh, isn't that your provisionist doctrine? Of course, yeah. I mean, that's exactly what we would say. Uh, and we, we've talked about that quite regularly, is that um, that we obviously still believe God determines things. We still believe God makes choices. He intervenes. Yeah. Um, he's active yeah. in, in doing what he does. And so um, it just seems like uh, White is wanting to attack more of the straw man or, or push us over into an extreme view that seems... Uh, as, as heretical as possible, because uh, he would rather deal with that than our actual claims. Um, which brings us okay. to the next section here uh, of straw men fallacies, in fact. So let's examine a few of those. I put a montage of about four or five of these together. Let's listen. Expecting the foundation of Augustinian Calvinism. Now, the assumption of the book is that Augustine and Calvin are, that Calvin slavishly followed Augustine. And there are a couple of quotes he gives from, from Calvin that out of context sounds like that's what Calvin's saying. In context, they don't. That's what's taken this so long is that, you know, there's a lot of resources cited. You have to track them all down. And especially right now, that's not always easy to do. A lot of, um, like, the point is this. None of them are based upon a monotheistic worldview. None of them are based upon the prophets and apostles. None of them are based upon grammatical historical interpretation of New Testament texts. Um, none of that matters to Ken Wilson. What you do, what Ken Wilson does, is you just draw a nice straight line, get out a ruler, go, boom, elect in Calvin, boom, elect amongst the Manichaeans and Gnostics. Somehow, that Manichaean exegetical process was transferred lock, stock, and barrel from someone who didn't know almost any Greek and did not know Hebrew over 1,100 years unchanged and was inserted like a, like a USB drive into the brain of John Calvin. Okay, and Luther and Zwingli for parts of things too, but we can't get into all that. Um, it's, and it's directly inserted into John Calvin who just goes, Manichaean interpretation, exegesis, and starts writing uh, his commentaries on the Bible. Are you saying that Mu and Schreiner are devotees of Manny? Are you, can you prove that their exegetical methodology is based upon the worldview of Manichaeism? If you can't, then you've failed in your thesis. Okay, so it, I, I, cannot, I can never remember in our interview or any time I've talked to you or anything I've read from your work where there's some kind of a microchip where Manichaeanism is downloaded into John Calvin's brain or something like that. It seems like this is, again, just the logical fallacy, straw man arguments, isn't it? Uh, seems to be. Um, I don't remember ever saying any Calvinist is a devotee of Manny or that a Calvinist using Manichaean interpretations of Scripture is a devotee of Manny. Uh, I never said Reformed theology is Manichaeism or call Calvinists Manichaean Christians as White claims. It seems to be a deliberate misrepresentation by White, a straw man argument, as you say. Um, even if he'd read my summary book, he would know that I did not even call the later Augustine a Manichae, or a devotee of Manny. Uh, he exaggerates enormously to mi misrepresent his opponents so he can win an easy but meaningless victory. Um, Augustine brought into Christianity deterministic interpretations of Scripture uh, that no prior Christian for four centuries had interpreted that way. Augustine mixed Christianity with Manichaeism, um, and White seems not to know those facts. Um, other bishops of Augustine's time period accused him of Manichaeism before, before the Pelagian controversy. And in fact, Augustine was almost not even ordained as a bishop as a result. Uh, I quote 80 different scholars saying the early church fathers were free will. And to my knowledge, not one of those scholars um, is a provisionist, is a Southern Baptist, is a free grace person, or any similar theology that we hold. So it seems like what I pointed out is that you use actually unbiased scholars, even scholars who are in the Reformed camp, 
Um, and I have not yet heard, heard White do the same thing. I've not heard White even quote from an unbiased source at all to support his claims. Exactly. And, and I would challenge White to find me a modern non-Calvinist scholar who can also find uh, pre-Augustinian authors agreeing with White's determinist theology. Um, Augustinian Calvinism teaches this divine, unilateral predetermination of individuals' eternal destinies, either to heaven or to hell, without any input from humans or using foreknowledge of human choices. Um, there are 80 scholars cited my thesis who agree with me that early Christians were fighting that kind of pagan determinism by emphasizing human free will and human faith to respond positively to God. That even includes Augustine himself for 15 years. Uh, God did not need to infuse persons with this gift of faith. Um, now, I, I can imagine White would probably push back on some of the things you said here by reflecting maybe on our interview when I asked uh, about, um, you know, people uh, who, who uh, believed in, um, you know, theistic determinism post-Augustine. And, uh, and, and you, might, you, you referred to something to the effect of, well, not if they listen to the early church, because otherwise they're more of a Manichaean type Christian. Um, and, and what I hear you saying now is you're saying that when you, when you were referring to that, you were talking about there's no other route for this determinism than found in Manichaeanism. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that particular type where um, you have to resurrect wreck the dead, spiritually dead person and infuse faith in them. Um, Neoplatonism has some of that, but you cannot find it in Christianity before Augustine. Okay, and so that's what you're referencing when we when our interview. Yeah. Okay, well this this section here uh, gets into um, well it, it's when he accuses us, I think, of trying to say that there's a different God altogether. Uh, l listen to these these clips here. Statement is pinpoint accurate. But unfortunately, due to Luther's and Calvin's reliance upon Augustine, the unmerited grace of the Christian God did not triumph. In Augustinian Calvinism, Reformed theology, it was the radicalized grace of the Manichaean God who triumphed. So, Susan says, false gospel. Ken Wilson says, different God, Manichaean God. Um, this is radical. It is utterly unsubstantiated by his argumentation. Um, and we're going to demonstrate that. And then if he wants to debate that, if he dares to put that out there and then say, yeah, I will demonstrate, I will prove that because Manichaeans interpreted a verse in a way I think they interpreted it, that's why, that's how everybody else has done it. That there is no grammatical, historical uh, exegesis going on in any of Calvin, any of Luther. The Bible had nothing to do with this. It's all just Manichaeism. It's the only way to be consistent and careful uh, and accurate. And we want, we demand that of others. We say to others, you need to be accurate. Um, and uh, therefore, we have to do the same thing. All right. So the whole idea that the Manichaean God even has the attributes to be able to have a divine decree of self-revelation so as to accomplish without failure the redemption of a particular people in Christ it's just not there it's ridiculous to so to try so to to draw that kind of parallel and say that Calvin's god and Luther's god is the Manichaean god that's what that's what you're being told that is so radical that it's astonishing. All right. So is Dr. White accurately representing you here, Dr. Wilson? Uh, no. Um, he seems to be the undisputed master of the straw man argument. Uh, I never said those things verbally or in writing. Uh, Augustine's understanding of the grace of a different God, not a different God. We have to read the words carefully. The early church fathers, including Augustine before 412, taught this about original sin. Original sin was physical death, a sin propensity, and a moral weakness with 
a residual capacity to respond to God positively with human faith, not divinely gifted faith. So Augustine borrows Manichaean teachings adding inherited guilt from Adam that damns humans at birth and the total inability to respond positively. That God must bestow unilateral grace infused into the dead soul and give faith to resurrect that spiritually dead person who is incapable of responding to God positively. That is Manichaean, not Christian anthropology. Augustine brings that into Christianity. You cannot find one Christian author before Augustine with that view. Augustine added reatus, inherited damnable guilt from Adam. And that's not just from you. Um, in the previous broadcast that I've responded, I've quoted from Herman Baving, who's a Reformed scholar. I've, re I've quoted from Lorraine Bettner, a Reformed scholar, and about five others, including Calvin himself, who, who all say, at least the first two that I just quoted there, say that, that the earliest church fathers did not teach this moral incapacity of the will that they did, they did say that I think, as Babbitt put it, that you can receive or reject the grace proffered by God. Um, they yeah. did not uh, teach irresistible grace. Um, th these are things again. Reformed historians have concluded, um, and so in this next section, there's I put together about six clips. They're not real long, so bear with me here. But there's six clips that are ultimately there's 15 hours of this to go through. <laughs> there's a bunch of broadcasts. And so I just kind of combined all of these together because they're basically making the same argument. And this is an essential argument for White, that the Manichaean hermeneutics in Scripture, uh, you'll hear what I mean. Let's listen. Wondering, I'm really looking forward to finding in here. I haven't found it yet, but I'm, I'm going to keep looking. The hermeneutical methodology that allows you to make a statement like what was just made there. Because what, what, is, what underlies that statement? Well, look at the verses they used. And they used them to support Manichaeism. Really, what verses do you think you could pull out of Paul to, um, to substantiate the idea that we are sparks of the realm of light trapped in dark bodies that were actually created by demons that made it and made Adam and Eve. Where do you exactly do you think you get that from Paul? Then could you please tell me how any person who is trying to deal honestly with the historical context of these writings could come up with the idea that, well, hey, the Manichaeans use these verses and the Calvinists use these verses. So, must be the same thing. So, why have a list like that? What is that supposed to communicate? It sounds good to someone who has zero understanding of logic or history. If, if that's what you're trying to do is impress that kind of person, okay. But to anyone who does any meaningful study of interreligious studies, interfaith uh, encounters, any type of, of missionary work, apologetics, studies, any church history, you're just left going, did you just say that in public? D did you just say to everybody that if you use the same verses? I was reminded, relevant to the the substance of the argument. But what you're saying is somebody else makes an argument like that and they're bad. So he's bad. So ignore the argument. See, this is, um, this is fallacious argumentation to the extreme. At the time you get to that point there, anybody who can confuse the dualistic, naturalistic, non-decretal, no monotheistic God determinism of Manichaeism without a Reformed theology is just not functioning with the full deck. That's just dishonest. It's just dishonest in its extreme.
I, I, that's just that's just as clear as you can as you could possibly make it. All right. Well, uh, once again, these all appear to be uh, straw man arguments to me. I agree. Straw man arguments. Um, White's not carefully read my entire thesis yet. Attacks it, but he's correct in one thing: using the same verses does not make a person a Manichaean. The Manichaeans interpreted Paul, the apostle, as teaching determinism. Uh, read Augustine's anti-Manichaean works. Prior to Augustine, and despite Manichaeism being around for 150 years, you cannot find Christian interpretations of Paul as teaching unilateral determinism of eternal destinies. Even Augustine argued against those Manichaean deterministic interpretations of those verses for 15 years using traditional residual human free will responding positively to God. Then in 412, he switched to determinism using the very same Manichaean scriptures and interpretations he had learned as a Manichaean. Interpretations he then, as a Christian, refuted. Does White not see that as a problem? Um, how is that me being dishonest and not White being dishonest? White seems to be ignoring the real evidence by not reading it to his audience. He reads very selectively. And this is one of the things that I tweeted about where I said, what, what if the shoes were on the other foot here? What if for the first three to 400 years, we had statement after statement affirming irresistible grace, affirming uh, total inability from birth types of statements, just pretty obviously clear that that was happening. And even um, free will scholars admitting, yeah, there's a lot of in the first three, 400 years of very deterministic writings. Um, and, and just suppose the shoes were on the other foot. You can imagine what Calvinists like James White would be doing. They, they would be talking about this uh, endlessly. Uh, it seems like Calvinists are really good at promoting the historical figures who uh, promote their views. I mean, you see it with, you know, T-shirts literally that say Calvin is my homeboy and things like this. I mean, it would it would be all over the place. You know, uh, Irenaeus is my homeboy or, you know, uh, Justin Martyr is my homeboy. And they would have Justin Martyr T-shirts and all these other kinds of things because they, they are very good at promoting people who who teach the things that they teach. Um, and, and that's why I'm just saying if to be objective, you've got to put the shoe on the other foot and ask yourself, can we be fair here? Look look at the evidence. Look at what your own scholars are saying with regard to the first three to 400 years of, of Christian authorship. And I, and I think yeah. that's what we've got to do here. So here's some more on Manichaeanism from Dr. White, uh, a couple more clips. But a argument on this subject had not come up to this point. There was no debate. That's right. There was no debate. Not because it was something that everybody had already decided on and there was a unanimous position. That's the that's the faux position here. Is that yeah, we've all discussed that. We we're all on the same page. Everybody believed the same thing. And then Augustine came along and turned us all into Manichaeans. No. And there you go. Um, sorry parents if <laughs> if you left your kids sitting in the room and I had to start Describing some of the Manichaean beliefs, but um, we, all we Calvinists are secret Manichaeans. Anyways, that's what we've we've been told by Oxford scholar. So that's what we are. So that's we're we're just going to sneak it in whenever we can because um, because of something. Uh, well, it seems like a little bit <laughs> a little bit more straw man arguments to me. Uh, what do you think? Absolutely. Um, for him to criticize me as unscholarly and not a serious historian when he behaves like this is interesting. Yeah, <laughs> to, say, to, say the least, to say the least. Um, well, in the, in the next, in the next clip, um, D Dr. White's going to explain for you, Dr. Wilson, the differences between Calvinists, Stoics, Gnostics, and Manichaeans because I know you know seven languages, uh, and I know that you wrote a, a doctoral dissertation um, for Oxford that was critiqued by leading scholars in the field, and that you're referred to by other leading scholars in the field as one of the leading uh, scholars on Augustine's writing. I, I know that's all true, but you probably didn't realize 
that there was differences between Calvinists, Stoics, Gnostics, and Manichaeans. I mean, I'm glad somebody, I'm being, I'm being a little facetious, but it's, it's just hard not to be because it really does. It seems like he's trying, it seems like to me, at least, it seems like he, he, it feels like he's patronizing us on this side of things by saying, okay, you guys just aren't aware or you don't care about uh, the differences between Calvinist and the Stoics and the Gnostics and the Manichaeans. And he spends a lot of time talking about all these differences without talking about the one similarity that the yep. reformer the reformers that I quoted from earlier, the, the, the one similarity that we do think influence early Christian church through Augustine is his philosophical, his philosophical views of determinism, which is consistent with the Manichaeans. Are there some distinctions and differences? Of course, we've acknowledged that. Um, but it, it gets frustrating to me because he, he seems to be talking about things as if you you wouldn't already know these di- distinctions and differences. I, I don't know how frustrating that was to you, but it was a little bit frustrating to me, uh, to be honest with you. Yeah, Leighton, um, he, he does typically use hyperbole to the extreme to try to make his point, um, but by using hyperbole, he, he loses it, um, saying it's a different God. Um, the text plainly says it was the grace of a different God, not a different God. He misses the entire point. Uh, it's that Augustine changed not to a Manichaean God. He took the grace concept of the Manichaean God and put it into the context of Christianity's God. So again, he's he seems to be deliberately misrepresenting what's plainly written in order to avoid the conclusion. Well, l- let me let me play that clip just real quick so you can see what we're talking about. Warfield's statement is pinpoint accurate, but unfortunately, due to Luth- Luther's and Calvin's reliance upon Augustine, the unmerited grace of the Christian God did not triumph. In Augustinian Calvinism, parenthesis, reformed, parenthesis closed, theology, it was the radicalized grace of the Manichaean God that triumphed. So the Reformation had a different God. That's Ken Wilson's, that's not Ken Wilson's conclusion based upon his studies. That's where he started, and that is plainly seen here plainly seen here. I don't know how any dissertation advisor, any Dr. Vader, did not see that because it's so obvious. Well, and just as you said, it seems like White is saying that you are you believe it's a different God, and that's that's obviously not true. Um, he, he goes through I mean, another combination of clips here where he, he talks a little bit about more about Manichaeanism and Christianity and how it's uh, completely different and all these kinds of things and uh, redefinitions. So let's uh, listen to these clips. That there is no single objective Gnostic doctrine of determinism that is that could ever logically or rationally be said to be identical to, parental to, ancestor of, the personal, self-glorifying decree of the triune God of the Christian scriptures. To me, he didn't know Reformed theology then. I don't think he does now, and I don't think he can hear it any longer, to be perfectly honest with you. But if the more you know about Reformed theology, and the more you know about that stuff, the more you realize there is no connection between the two. And trying to forge a connection is a fool's errand. Is a fool's errand. It really is. Uh, same way, since since you need to have that foundation to give meaning to the discussion of soteriology. Um, in this situation, you have to have the one true God of Scripture to give meaning to a discussion of such things as Adam, Adam's nature, federal headship. Um, the application of God's law, um, the whole concept of, of uh, guilt, all of these things are being used in a Christian context, a monotheistic, Trinitarian Christian context. You cannot transfer that to Manichaeism. 
because everything ends up becoming redefined. Just as in Mormonism, all the language that we use is redefined by the polytheism of Mormonism and the fact that God's an exalted man, that we're all the same nature as God. Stoicism. And then, even then, now you're going to have to distinguish greatly between that and the Essene community at Qumran. Um, you'll see why I'm emphasizing that later. Um, that is seen in Book of Discipline and the other, other materials from Dead Sea Scrolls, which plainly is deeply influenced by something called the Hebrew Scriptures. <laughs> and hence is not mechanistic. Now, what's a, what's a mechanistic concept of determinism? Well, it would be something along the lines of that there are um, laws of cause and effect that rule the physical universe. And that since everything is cause and effect, and the, these laws determine what, which way things are going to go, then it's not that there is an external mind that is revealing itself and ordering things, it is the nature of, of the created universe itself that contains within itself immutable laws that make it deterministic. White seems here in this section to be kind of missing the forest for the trees. He, he's not seeing, at least in my, my view, he's not seeing the big picture here. Uh, again, um, Stoics, Gnostics, Manichaeans, Kumarites, Neoplatonists, they're all discussed in my thesis with their particular views of Dewey. Uh, my thesis was over 300,000 words when I finished. Um, this thesis book, you see, is only 100,000 pages. It's less than a third of what I actually wrote. So even the thesis book is summarized. So I have to apologize for not being able to present all of the early church fathers that I studied in detail and all of the work on Gnosticism, Neoplatonism, Stoic, Stoicism, Manichaeism. I just couldn't do it. Um, White consistently and repeatedly retreats to this alleged invalid distinction between all of their ancient religions and modern Calvinist Christianity. As you said, he completely ignores Augustine's introduction of deterministic concepts into Christianity from his prior decades of involvement in not one, but all three, one, two, three, of the most highly deterministic groups in the ancient world, Stoicism, Manichaeism, and Neoplatonism. So according to White, Augustine spends decades studying, participating in these three highly deterministic groups, yet they did not affect Augustine's view of determinism. After teaching free will without determinism for 15 years, one day Augustine simply picks up his Bible and voila, Paul was teaching determinism, just like the Manichaeans had said all along. Hmm. All prior Christians had missed it and had refuted that determinism. That takes a lot of faith in one fallible man steeped in determinism for decades, but somehow not affected at all. Unbelievable, <laughs> is, literally unbelievable. It's like one uh, person tweeted that um, it, it, he thinks it's, it's kind of crazy to call us Pelagians uh, when we haven't even read Pelagius yet somehow call it absurd to even insinuate that that uh, Augustine might be influenced by Manichaeanism when he was an actual Manichaean for 10 years of his life. It's, it's not a huge stretch. Uh, and again, it, it just seems to me that, that White keeps holding on to this, that if I can show that uh, Augustine didn't import every aspect of Manichaeanism and all its weirdness, then I have, I have demonstrated conclusively that he has not been influenced at all or that he hasn't brought any aspect of Manichaeanism, um, namely um, theistic determinism, into the Christian church. Um, here's, a, here's another one on his, White's distinction between what he calls, well, Reformed theology is deterministic. He does admit that at least. Um, but it, it's not, but, but, but it's personally deterministic, he says. L listen to what he says. 
Determinism is a term that's thrown around a great deal in regards to the sovereignty of God and the existence of his divine decree. And so Reformed theology is deterministic, but it is personally deterministic. And that person is the person of God. All right, so Dr. Wilson, uh, speak to White's repeated defense of deterministic versus, quote-unquote, personally deterministic. Sure. Uh, before Augustine became a bishop, his very first book was On Providence. This espoused a meticulous, micromanaging God. Numerous scholars described the significant influence of Stoicism on Augustine through Cicero, he actually pronounced it right. It's everybody says Cicero, but in Latin it should I be Cicero. Probably, I would probably uh, say Cicero. <laughs> well, everybody does. Um, through Cicero and Chrysippus, that's where Augustine really picked up his, his Stoicism. Young, who translated Cicero's Cicero's on fate, said, Cicero regards fate or destiny as the decree of God, the inevitable dictum of providence. Let me read it again. Cicero regards fate or destiny as the decree of God, the inevitable dictum of providence. So, Augustine echoed this in the City of God 5.1. If, let me read it, if anyone ascribes them to fate because he uses the term fate to mean the will and power of God, let him hold to his meaning, but correct his terminology. End of quote. So to Augustine, deterministic versus personally deterministic meant replacing fate with the Christian God decree. Of course there are differences, but meticulous micromanaging of Stoic fate had now become the all-encompassing decrees of the Christian God. So, and we've talked about this before in other episodes, where a naturalistic determinist says that all things are coming to back to pass through determinism of nature. You know, just events, prior yeah. events that that cause these different things. Um, whereas, obviously, theistic determinists are saying it all comes to pass not just through big bang, you know, natural processes, but through a a creator. Um, one who sovereignly yeah. decrees all things that come to pass. Um, and, and then that brings the question of, do some of the same issues that arise for the naturalistic determinist, um, like how do you hold people morally responsible for their choices and those kinds of things, can they be yeah. applied to theistic determinists? And, and I think that there can be some overlap there. In fact, uh, in our broadcast, uh, replying to uh, Bing Yong's book on the subject, we get into that. Uh, Dr. Hunter and, and Dr. Stratton and I all uh, discuss how those things are, if you're interested in going deeper into that. But let's uh, look at this next section here, where, again, he, he talks about Manichaean's uh, determinism versus Calvinistic determinism. When you hear that we are determinists, what does that mean? And if you're if you're a Calvinist, you tend to just go, well, yeah, God God decrees. I mean, Ephesians one eleven. That's what it says. Um, it, that's worked out in Acts two, Acts four, Isaiah ten, Genesis fifty, all over the place. Um, this is biblical teaching. Yeah, okay. But what I've been forced to do is to expand my understanding of the categories of what determinism means because. For example, they, the provisionists, argue uh, that the Manichaeans were determinists, and that's where Augustine got it, and then, then that's where Calvin got it, and that's why you and me. The Bible has nothing to do with well, what, what we believe. See, you need to understand that. We've, we, just, we just said, as long as Augustine says it, I believe it. Most, of, most Calvinists I know have, have read a few paragraphs of Augustine, may have read the Confessions, um, haven't read, and he, they, they haven't read anything he wrote against Julian or the Manichaean movement. Or anything. No, no idea. But that's what we're being told now. Is it's just a straight line, unmodified, boom, 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 which, of course, is absurd on his face. But anyway... That's what we're being told about this stuff. 
Now, you may not have been aware of it, Dr. Wilson, um, but there are different types of determinism, in case you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Layden, for You're informing welcome. me. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I've extensively studied secular philosophy on causation, free will, and all types of determinism. Um, I'm, the current book I'm writing will have a whole section on secular philosophy on those issues. Happy to debate that with White if he wants. Uh, yes, there are major differences. Augustine knew them. Uh, but the key is, again, understanding Augustine's syncretism, incorporating those deterministic concepts into Christianity, deterministic concepts that were never there previously in Christianity. Um, Augustine baptized Stoic thought into Christianity. For example, uh, read uh, Augustine. Ancient Thought Baptized by John Rist from Cambridge Press. Uh, or you can read Sarah Bias' chapter, uh, Augustine's Debt to Stoicism in the Confessions. Uh, that's in the Rudledge Handbook of the Stoic Tradition, 2015. Um, White errs by appealing to only differences while ignoring key connecting concepts. Uh, he seems to argue Christianity in general was influenced somewhat by pagan thought but Calvinism, his Calvinism is exempted, excused from being influenced by pagan thought. That is the fallacy of special pleading. And, and I think also what people have got to consider is if Calvinism is wrong, I mean, you've kind of got to step into that world to be objective. OK, if Calvinism is wrong, then how was it improperly introduced within the church? That's, if you ask yourself those questions... Yeah. And so let's just just pretend that Calvinism for sure, like, let's just say God appears to us right now and just says, uh, Calvinism is incorrect theology. We just all know it. OK, so we just absolutely yeah. sure it is absolutely false. So then we would look back and go, OK, where did we make our error? Where, where did this shift take place? Where did it happen? And this yeah. is where your thesis really steps in to show this is where it happened. This is where it was first introduced. This is the first record of it, even by Reformed historians' own uh, studies and estimations. Um, and so th that's the yeah. importance of this, is to, sh to demonstrate if, if Calvinism is false, this is most likely how um, it was introduced into the church and where the, the, the line kind of diverges into this more deterministic way of, of, of seeing things. So let's look at this next section of, of clips from Dr. White like a minority of Christians any longer have a theology that's robust enough to go, and you know what? God's in control of it. He's in control of it. I can't tell you how many people I've seen that go, God doesn't have anything to do with this virus, and he didn't have anything to do with bringing it about, and he's not. And you're just like, what Bible have you been reading? Uh, it's not, not the one, one I've been reading. There's Lots of plagues in the Old Testament, and God wasn't caught by surprise by any of them. In fact, they all seem to be completely under his control. Completely. So what, what, what Bible are you reading? Well, you're reading the same Bible, but you've adopted a secular lens through which to filter out anything that is offensive to that secular worldview. That's unfortunately what we see all over the place. All right. So the reason I played that clip is is he wasn't addressing us specifically here, um, which is sometimes when you can find the the inconsistencies or the double standards. Uh, could could White's argument apply to Calvinist as well? Could could Calvinist be reading the text from a Manichaean worldview without knowing anything about Manichaeanism? Exactly. Um, I think Calvinists have adopted a Stoic and Manichaean deterministic interpretation of Scripture of God as micromanaging. Uh, this deterministic interpretation was not present in Christianity prior to Augustine. Determinism was Stoic, Gnostic, Manichaean, and Neoplatonic. So Augustine brings it into Christianity. So Calvin's interpretations were dependent upon Augustine's underlying assume determinism in scripture. Well, explain that, unpack that a little bit further, because I can, I can hear White in my head. <laughs> I've been listening to him quite a bit, as you can imagine. Um, I can hear him pushing back on that and saying, okay, there's a direct, you, so you just think he's downloaded it as, you know, like a computer chip into his brain or, so how is the, how has Calvin been influenced? Explain that. Yeah, good, good, good question. So Calvin's exegesis of the text, when he comes to the text, it assumes an underlying determinism. That same thing is done by the modern Calvinists. They assume 
an underlying determinism as they do the exegesis. So when you start with a paradigm of determinism as your foundation, your exegesis will always follow it. Uh, you do not need to know anything, nothing, zero, about Manichaean determinism to imbibe it. Why? Because you've read Calvin, who read Augustine, who spent decades as a determinist in Stoicism, Manichaeism, and Neoplatonism. Yeah, so and, and you might not even, even read Calvin. You may read John MacArthur, for example. Yeah. Or John, you may read yeah. John Piper. Um, and, and so there's the influence. And plus, you have to ask yourself the question, um, if, if there was no determinism at all within any of the teachings, no, no Calvinistic theology, and James White, for the very first time, picks up his Bible, and he's, he's the first one to read Romans 9 and Ephesians 1 in that deterministic way, um, and, and he interprets all of a sudden that um, people are born morally incapable for the very first time. He's the one who comes up with that tulip concept. Nobody would take him seriously. Everything, everybody would just assume that he has no grounds on which to stand. And that this is what we're trying to point out, is that we're not trying to say that just because you happen to believe deterministically, Calvinistically, therefore you you listen to Manny or Monty or Manichaeanism theology. We're not trying to say that. We're, we're trying to say it's influenced the church as a whole, and therefore just the, 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 the kind of the precursor of deterministic thought can be in your mind. And therefore, when you're reading the text with those things, those lenses on, like we talked about before, then all of a sudden you read a text differently than the way you would have read it otherwise. And so it seems to me that the main point that White repeatedly emphasizes is that the Christian God who decreed everything is different from the, the deterministic Stoics, Gnostics, Manichaeans, who all held to different views of determinism. So you really just yeah. can't, can't compare it. You shouldn't compare it. You're stupid to compare it. You're, 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 you, sh you're, you have, you have, a, you're all, I mean, all kinds of just uh, hyperbolic statements about anybody who even tries to compare the determinism of, of Manichaeans to the determinism of, of Calvinists. But what else can you say about that claim? <laughs> um, so I would ask, where in Scripture does it state God decreed everything. You cannot find it. God does decree some things, but not everything. Scripture states God controls the stars and every speck in the universe. But where does it say God, will, God micromanages every world event by prior decree? Calvinists assume God decrees everything. Why? because Augustine brought micromanaging Stoic providence into Christianity, and he used Manichaean interpretation of Scripture verses to prove determinism theologically in Ephesians 1 and 2. According to scholars who I quote in the thesis, the only Jews who ever taught meticulous providence were the Qumranites and Philo. Both were heavily influenced by Stoicism, according to those scholars. So our Old Testament, their Tanakh, did not teach meticulous determinism, according to almost all Jews. In the New Testament, no scholar I have read views Paul as teaching determinism, except Calvinist. No, not one non-Calvinist scholar I know has written that an early church father held Augustine's deterministic view of God in unilaterally assigning eternal destinies. So where did Augustine's meticulous providence originate? Was it divine revelation? I doubt it. Uh, true scholars point to deterministic Stoicism, Gnosticism, Manichaeism, and Neoplatonism, exactly as I stated. So Augustine tweaked Manichaean anthropology of damnation by created birth, created birth, into damnation by inherited guilt from Adam at birth, by fallen nature of Adam, not created nature by the <laughs> bad God. So his peers did not consider that difference between fallen nature and created nature significant. Uh, it was Christianized Manichaean anthropology damned at birth by fallen nature, not created nature, but still damned at birth. 
They did not see this as a Christian doctrine. It was a Manichaean doctrine that had been baptized. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, you mentioned the scriptures, and th this is something we we try to go over quite regularly in our program. Uh, and this is when we have guests on who are Calvinists, we ask that question: Where where does the Bible teach that God decreed everything, including besetting sins and uh, you know sinful thoughts and pride? I mean, First John two sixteen says the the lust of the flesh and the pride of life are not from the Father, but from the world. And yet your doctrine says they're from God's sovereign decree, ultimately. Um, and, and I haven't heard at least a satisfying answer from Calvinist on that point. In fact, you've got Jeremiah 19, 5 that says when they're burning their children to Melech, not only it says, I did not command it, but in the ESV, it says, nor did I decree it, nor did it enter my mind. And yet Calvinists say God decrees everything, yet the scriptures say he didn't decree at least that. Um, and so, and there are many other verses, uh, James obviously yeah, saying he doesn't right. tempt men to evil and, and so many other passages that really uh, seek, and it seems to me, to distance God from the evil of the world. Um, and that's really a defense of his holiness. That's one of the things that we try to emphasize. The reason we're doing this is not just right. to, to, like that we're bowing at the altar of man's free will. We, we are trying to, <laughs> we're trying to protect the, the, what the Bible teaches with regard to the holiness and the character and the goodness of God. And that's what's that's right. so vital here. And the yep. number one verse that I hear James White quote to support this concept of God's decree of everything that happens is Ephesians 1.11, which is completely misaligned because that, that's actually in the active uh, tense where he says he's working all things uh, f f according to his will. That's, he's actively working all things together for good. It's just like in Romans 8, 28. He's, he, the fact that God yeah. works all things together for good for those who love him, for those who are in him, as in Ephesians 1, is talking about those who are in Christ. The fact that God works out good for all the who are in him, that, that's something we all universally hold to. And there's nothing in Ephesians 1, 11 that suggests this dupied or this um, e exhausted divine determinism or God's decree of, of every human thought, action, and deed. Um, with that in mind, let's listen to this next section of clips from Dr. White. That is first and foremost about the revelation of God's character and the accomplishment of his self-glorification in the joining of a particular people to himself in and through Jesus Christ. If you can, if you can just sit back and say, oh, see, Manichaean determinism, Calvinist determinism, same thing. No, not even close. Um, that's. Can you see that the term grace of a Manichaean deity is different than the grace of the triune God of Scripture? You, you think there, there might be just a smidge of a difference between the two? Against Stoics and against Manichaeans and Gnostics. They're saying, no, the Christian God is a relational God. He... He, in his foreknowledge, knows who's going to respond and who's not. It's not just this arbitrary thing that happens like the Stoics believe and like the Gnostics believe and like the Manichaeans believe. Now, you see how you put them all together? No serious scholar would ever do that. No serious scholar who wants to be honest with what Stoicism believed, what, which group of Gnostics, there are so many different groups of Gnostics with so many different perspectives. All right, so set aside for a second White's ad hominem argument there. And um, he, he says the differences are just so immense. They're absolutely, it's just crazy that any parallel could possibly be drawn. What do you say to that? Um, that's a non sequitur. That means it does not follow logically. Um, let's say, well, somebody could say this. Um, there could be no meaningful parallels between Calvinist and provisionist. Uh, Calvinists assert uh, God foreordained and decreed all rapes, genocides, murders, wars, child sexual abuse. Provisionists do not view God as decreeing evil. In Calvinism, uh, humans are eternally damned to hell at birth from the inherited guilt of Adam. Provisionists deny babies are eternally damned at birth. In Calvinism, God elects only a few people very mysteriously uh, provisionists say God equally loves and invites all persons to salvation. For Calvinists, God's sovereignty is paramount. Provisionists say God's love is paramount. Enormous differences in who God is. Very different gods. Therefore, 
no parallels can be made. Whoa, <laughs> I would respond to that person like this. Uh, wait a minute, both groups believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God who saves us from our sins. That's not a valid parallel. We can find important common elements. Similarly, although they are very different, meaningful parallels can be drawn between Stoicism, Gnosticism, Manichaeism, and Neoplatonism, and Augustinian Calvinism. Many other scholars have already drawn those parallels with Augustine. For one, you could look up Professor uh, Johannes van Oort uh, on Augustine's incorporation of Manichaeism. White's favorite argument is not valid. It's a non sequitur. Yeah, and, 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 that's, uh, and that, this is what we we're talking about before, is that the reason we don't cast out Calvinist as, you know, uh, unbelievers or as non-Christians is because we do hold some commonality with our belief in Christ. Um, and, and we may refer to different gods in the sense that we're, we're describing different views of God is obviously what we mean by that. Um, but we believe they, they obviously worship the the. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, just like we do, we, we, we believe they have misunderstood some scriptures and therefore are describing God with characteristics that he does not have. And therefore, that's why we're trying to bring correction. Like I said before, uh, not bowing at the altar of free will, but really trying to, to maintain what the Bible teaches with regard to God's holiness and his character and the genuineness of his love and provision and desire for people to be saved. We, we want to uphold that as important. Um, here's another little section that um, that I wanted you to listen to, too, Dr. Wilson. But what you want to do is you want to plant in the mind the idea. They were teaching the same thing. Augustine went back, picked it up. That's where it came from. No one had ever dreamed of this. Don't worry about what anybody said before this. Don't read anything that, that, that Clement said. Don't, don't read the Epistle to Diognetius. You don't, don't, don't look. No, don't. They were all on the same page. They were Southern Baptist provisionists. That's they were. Just, just believe me. I went to Oxford. I know. I read it all. Dr. Wilson, I, until I watched Dr. Wilson, I didn't really even know that you are a Southern Baptist provision, just like me. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to I'm going to nominate you for the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Now that I know that, are you, are you ready? Are you ready to sign on? Are Are you a Southern Baptist provisionist? I, I don't think they'd take me, Layden. I, I am not a Southern Baptist. Uh, I'm uh, non-denominational. Uh, in fact, uh, to be honest, I'd never even heard of provisionist until I heard it from you. Yeah. So. Well, I, we we came up with that term because we didn't like to be called traditionalists because that was uh, limiting us to. Southern Baptist history uh, just yeah. over the last 100 years or so. And so we, we never liked that label traditionalist. Um, somebody tweeted on, uh, on the other day that we should be called originalist uh, because our, our doctrines are original. <laughs> so oh, it's just no. like that some people say, ca call us a biblicist because our doctrines are found in the Bible. And there's always better labels out there, I guess, for people if they're looking for them. So yeah, here, here are a couple more uh, clips I want you to hear. Don't, don't hear me wrong. All of us, our traditions, have been impacted by those who have come before us. But this kind of simplistic, straight line stuff is simply absurd. That introduced, that, that makes a straight line laughing, laughably silly and simplistic and erroneous. That's why nobody believes it. That's, well, no one should believe it. Okay, now these were the ones that I was kind of embarrassed when I was sending you the clips. Um, and I was, I, I, after listening to him, I was like, I don't even know if I want to send these to Dr. Wilson because they're so insulting. Um, it, saying things like, your work is so laughable and no one should even believe it. I, I was really curious to even watch your face while you were listening to these things. Uh, what, what was your response? What did you think about this? Well, I think what White means is that no Calvinist believes it. Well, yeah. uh, Obviously. Um, <laughs> many excellent scholars now believe my thesis is correct, uh, and it's changing the way scholars view Augustine. One of them said, Augustine's uh, place in history will forever be changed. Uh, that's a quote. There are indeed some angry Roman Catholics who are pushing back. Um, I call them Augustinian groupies. Um, I've heard some literally say, Augustine is my hero. 
<laughs> um, I'll take that. A little T-shirt on. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I'll I'll side with uh, White and say let's go with Athanasius instead. Um, when, when I wrote the foundation of Augustinian Calvinism, my wife was very concerned that Calvinists would lose their faith. I laughed. That was my turn to laugh. I told her there is no way a Calvinist could admit the truth on this matter. Why? Because their whole system crumbles to the ground. They will fight to the death with the logical fallacies and rhetoric to protect their turf. Yeah, I think White kind of proves, proves your point on that because he's, he's willing to fight wildly and use all kinds of fallacious rhetoric uh, really to protect his turf. Um, and uh, well, here, the, the straight line argument where like the downloading kind of thing that you just down this straight line argument that White keeps using, what's, what's your reply to that? Um, well, White should know that syncretism is never a straight line. Augustine surreptitiously brought determinism into Christianity through syncretism, combining elements from various religions and philosophies. Right. Um, White seems to ignore the fact that scholars far superior to him, they're paying attention to this book and re reconsidering their positions. Uh, if you look at the back of my summary book, Foundations, uh, read Professor Carla Pullman's words. Uh, she's a world-renowned professor of religion in the UK. She's not a friend of mine, and I have no idea if she's a Christian or not. Uh, she describes my thesis as groundbreaking. Uh, to simplify for White, that means nobody has broken this ground before. I have provided critical new information. She also wrote thought-provoking. Uh, that means you have to think about my research instead of knee-jerk ranting against it. She wrote, quote, indispensable for every serious student of hugely influential aspects of Augustine's thought. That means a serious scholar cannot do work on Augustine without reading my thesis. So now that I have simplified Dr. Pullman's words, maybe it's White's view that is laughable. Um, is there an Augustinian scholar who even knows James White, who he is? Um, if you Google the book Foundation of Aust Augustinian Calvinism, you can read Professor Pullman's comments for yourself. You don't even have to buy the book. Just, just get online, look at the back of the book. So you really have a choice. You can believe a famous Augustinian university scholar, or you can believe White, who has not even read Augustine. Well, and, and also, obviously, White has something to defend here. I mean, he, he's, he is not an unbiased scholar by any stretch of the imagination. And that's why when you can find unbiased scholars, um, and you can find even reformed scholars who are willing to be intellectually honest enough to uh, admit some of the things that you're saying. And, and one of the importance of, of your thesis, I think, is to demonstrate what some people think or have claimed is that Augustine, because he read through Romans, that's what led him, you know, to to give up uh, his free will views and to adopt a more deterministic philosophy. But if what you're saying is true, it's not when he was reading through Romans that that happened. It was actually later during his debate with Pelagius. And anybody who knows anything about debating, and I know a little bit about it, um, it pushes you to really go hard to defend your view. And sometimes you find yourself willing to go further than you would go before. And, and, I, and I've seen this where, um, where people who agree with me, who, who are further on the fringe of, of differing views that I do not hold to, um, se seem to side along with me and are encouraging me to keep going that direction. Um, and, and I can see that as a, a tendency for people, if they're not careful in a debate, to take something further yeah. than they've ever gone before. And your thesis is demonstrating that's, that's precisely what very likely did happen with Augustine, especially if we consider the fact that Calvinism is false, then this probably is the way that it was introduced within the church. Yeah. It seems reasonable. Yeah, Augustinian scholars have already made that point, yeah. that it was in the heat of battle that he overstepped. Famous scholars. Well, now, other other than your thesis and its summary, have you have you written anything else on on Augustine? Um, yes, I have two articles in Studia Patristica on Augustine. I have a third one in line for publication next year um, in June 2020, next month six weeks. 
I have an article in the Journal of Biblical Literature. Oh, wow. Uh, that's, one of the, that's one of the most prestigious yeah. theological journals in the world. Yeah, it is. Uh, now, that one is entitled, Reading James 2, 18 through 20 with anti donistist Eyes, Untangling Augustine's Exegetical Legacy. Uh, and it shows why the lordship justification position is anachronistic in James about these false Christians lacking good works. Um, it seems mm -hmm. lordship justificationists are in trouble on their favorite proof text. Yeah. <laughs> so it seems like you might be just a little bit, just a tad, maybe a <laughs> more qualified than Dr. White is, at least based upon, I mean, he, he, he did reference the fact that he's, he was teaching history in the nineties when you were, before you got your degree. Um, but I don't know. When you compare the resumes, it just seems like you might be just a little bit more knowledgeable about the subject than Dr. White might be. I'm just saying. Yeah. Um, well, White is very knowledgeable on many topics, uh, and I appreciate that. He, he does a good job. When he's explaining other things, he does a good job. He does. Uh, but, but he does not even know some basic information about Augustine. Well, let's hear a little bit more about what White thinks about you. Jesus. Um. All the serious historians I know recognize the need for having categorical thought and contextual thought and a recognition that you you just can't, this is invalid transfer of terminology. Um, but there you go. Uh, there's, there's, there's your assertion. I, I th th he, this is the only gentleman that I know of who has this theory, this thesis. Um, all the serious historians I know recognize the need for having categorical thought and contextual thought and a recognition that you you just can't this is invalid transfer of terminology um but there you go okay so here um audaciously white uh repeatedly accuses you of not being a, a serious scholar or a serious historian what do you think about that well, White has not even read the entire thesis carefully, uh, yet he attacks it and me as unscholarly and laughable. Um, uh, in contrast, many scholars with legitimate accredited PhDs and THGs are taking my thesis book very seriously. Um, could it be that White, not me, is the one who's biased? It kind of seems like that. I mean, it seems like an unbiased approach would be saying things more like, you know, uh, Wilson overstepped here, or Mills, Wilson may have gone too far in this statement, or I'm going to take issue with this particular quote because of these reasons. But these very hyperbole, hyperbolic kinds of accusations and mischaracterizations, and he's just so laughable. These kinds of extremes just, I think it discredits his, uh, his critique. Um, Here's another clip I wanted us to, to respond to as well. Exactly. So when God's chalk in 800 taught it, though, because he wasn't the famous, you know, Augustine, you know, the yes. fighter, he was deemed a heretic. I, <clears throat> I'm not sure how much about God's chalk um, Leighton Flowers actually knows. Um, Leighton, honestly, without Googling, do you know who Ibertus and Retramnus were? If you don't, stop talking about, about um, God's talk, because you don't know what you're talking about. All right, we kind of see this throughout um, White's uh, responses, that he'll kind of shift from you and start talking to me. Um, and, and, and I'm not a, in the academic world. I'm not, I don't claim to be a scholar on early church fathers. And so what are these persons that he's just referring to with, with God's chalk there? What did they believe? And what did they write? You, you're the scholar here, and I know that. So I will defer to the scholar here on that point. <laughs> well, Layden, it really doesn't tell us much of anything. Um, Radbertus wrote on the Eucharist, not God chalk's predestination. Uh, so okay. White, White's wrong. He engages in empty rhetoric because he has no response for you. Um, in my church history historical theology class, my students are required to read Gottschalk's On Predestination as one of their primary sources. And despite protests by some scholars, Gottschalk constantly cites Augustine on double predestination to salvation and damnation. Don't like the term, but that's what it is. Gottschalk uses Augustine's same arguments. Gottschalk's books were burned and he was jailed. 
<laughs> uh, and by the way, Rabanus Marus was Gottschalk's key opponent, not Pascasius Radbertus, as White mistakenly implied. Um, so he uses an ad hominem argument against you since he could not come up with an answer. Well, and he, he seems to resort to that quite quite regularly, that if I can prove Leighton doesn't know how to do this or Leighton's not smart about that, then I've disproven the argument. And that's this is one of the reasons yeah. that I continue to say, okay, if a more qualified person said the exact same thing, how would you answer the argument then? And that's how you pick out an ad hominem. You just replace the person with somebody you think is qualified to make the same argument and then say, how would you answer it if, if the perfect person made this argument? How would you answer it then? Because yeah. you, can, you can always dodge by pointing out something wrong with the person. You know, that latent guy, yeah. you know, whatever. You can, you can find something about the person uh, in order to dismiss the argument. And that's why it's called an ad hominem. Ad hominem. It's to the man versus uh, to the argument. Yeah. Um, here's another little clip I want Timber. us to see. Because no matter what, what view you hold to, you can find some counsel somewhere that probably supported <laughs> whatever weird view you want to want to support. Uh, so, exactly. You know, so, um, yeah, they're both chuckling, but that's exactly what this is all about. You got a you you decide you're going to come up with a way of cramming Southern Baptist traditionalism into the early church. And so, yeah, you can find a quote here, a quote there, interpret it in your context, and boom, 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 you got it. Okay, now, now Dr. Wilson, you said you're not a Southern Baptist or a Southern Baptist traditionalist or a provisionist. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Um, yet, according to White, defending Southern Baptist traditionalism somehow was my goal in writing my thesis. Um, White's omniscience is not impressive. <laughs> so this is like when he accused me uh, at Southwest. He said Southwestern had hired me to start this podcast. You know, he just he's like he just his omniscience. He just knows. I've never I've never received a penny from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, but he just somehow knows that Southwestern is paying me to do a, uh, this podcast. I, that's a very interesting to me. Um, and he claims you're lying. When you say you were the first to read through all of Augustine's works chronologically, um, in fact, let's let's watch these clips. He's not the first person to have read through Augustine chronologically by any stretch of the imagination. Many people have done that in the past. Lots of people have read Augustine in chronological order. Uh, he's not the first person that's ever done that. Um, like I said, there there have been tremendous Augustine scholars down through the centuries. All right, Dr. Wilson, how do you how do you respond to the bold assertion that you are lying about being the first to do this? Um, maybe misguided omniscience or a rhetoric of ignorance. <laughs> I'm not sure which. Um, exactly six, six people in the entire world have read all of Augustine's extant works. Um, in fact, White had a copy of Alan Fitzgerald's Augustine Through the Ages on his desk. He, he showed it. A key book on Augustine. Yeah. Now, the editor, Dr. Fitzgerald, is one of the Augustinian experts in the world. And when I was at a private barbecue in Oxford, Dr. Fitzgerald told me that he knows only six people in the world who have read all of Augustine's extant works. Nobody had read them in order. So, Ms. White mistakenly thinks that all of those Augustinian scholars have read Augustine's entire corpus. But that is not how scholarship works these days. Scholars choose a very small portion and write on a very limited topic. And that is exactly why nobody discovered what I was able to discover. Nobody followed Augustine's own instructions. Read all of my works in order, chronologically looking for my changes. Nobody done it. Uh, in fact, Professor Guy Strumsva of Hebrew University, he was also a professor of Abrahamic religions at Oxford, a brilliant man, love him. He was astounded at my comprehensive work. It's a game changer. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously there could be some hillbilly in the middle of nowhere who has got on and read through Augustine's work, but you're, you're talking about in academia who have you know notable scholarship? They have it, it's been qualified, and almost like when you've got the uh, um, you know those books that you know the um, uh, that that record you know the fastest man in the world, 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is the fastest man in the world, according to, you know, people who are actually tracking it, but there may be a faster person somewhere out in the middle of nowhere that, that just has never been tracked. Um, and so we're, we're yeah. not trying to make the claim that, that there's nobody out there in the world we couldn't know that. But from what right. we know within the academic circles, there's nobody else who has done this, even according to the expert <laughs> on Augustine's writings. And so it seems like the, the expert uh, disagrees with Dr. White here, at least. Yes, um, White should be challenged to name just one, just one person he knows who's read all of Augustine chronologically. I, I would like to hear the name. Uh, if it's not a recognized scholar in ancient religion, um, like you said, could be somebody out there, then I'd be happy to vet that person by asking a question any person who had read through them all would know. Um, personally, I would believe the Augustinian expert Fitzgerald over White, who, again, by his own admission, has not even read most of Augustine's works. All right, let's go to the next section of clips here. Well, for example, it has been shown by others whose areas of specific proficiency are in this area that there were people before Augustine who held his view of baptismal regeneration and issues related to that. In regards to the subject of, um, of baptism. Therefore, if, in fact, you can demonstrate that there were people before Augustine that had the same view of baptism that Augustine did that you're not claiming were Manichaean and you can't establish any type of relationship between themselves and Manichaeism, then obviously the thesis fails at that particular point, is, is basically what some of the discussion going on um, is all about. So it seems it would be important to know a little bit more about Augustine's view of baptism, right? Yes. Um... White provides the party line on baptism for Catholics, Calvinists, and some Lutherans. Um, but again, White's never read Augustine's entire corpus, so it seems unlikely that he knows the various stages of baptismal development uh, in that issue. My thesis proves the party line is not correct. Now, it shows that nobody prior to Augustine said, innocent babies are damned to hell by Adam's inherited guilt and God's providence. Nobody said that before. Uh, my thesis specifically discusses baptism and infant baptism and demonstrated that the majority report is not true, uh, much to the dismay of many scholars. So yeah. no author with extant works claimed innocent babies must be baptized in water to avoid hell. Now, many scholars say Adam's sin was inherited no one says we inherit Adam's guilt unto eternal damnation. Oh, first. interesting. Huh. Okay. Yep. And Ambrose, uh, I think he brought up Ambrose, uh, Lutheran told him, uh, Ambrose did not teach hereditary guilt, damning one to hell at birth. Uh, and it had to be washed away by baptism. He actually talked about foot washing as that. So if you read my thesis, I quote the famous scholar J.N.D. Kelly on that fact. Uh, I think origin was also brought up. Um, but there, again, in my thesis, there's strong evidence that origin's work on Romans had a short passage inserted into it by an opponent, not uncommon in the ancient world. Why is that? Because the remainder of the context and all of his other writings, many, many writings, argue directly against that view. Read my thesis. Hmm. I... I cite 80 scholars, and they're not provisionists, they're not traditionalists, <laughs> who are saying the early church fathers believed in human free will and human faith to respond to God positively. Again, find me even one non-Calvinist scholar who finds an early church father holding White's deterministic view. I've read them extensively. Yeah. I, I could have I missed one. I, I'd like to see it. Show it to me. I'd like to review it. So I think the ball is in White's court to prove his case and prove me wrong. Uh, anybody can blog and spout unsupported opinions. Uh, let's have White write a book, have it published by a serious academic press like Bill or Zeebeck. Uh, not American publishers biased toward Calvinism 10 to 1, uh, Crossway, Zondervan, Baker. Uh, publish it with real academic publisher. Good luck. Well, on another note, I was looking for this here, but um, I was going to show it to you, but um, 
just kind of ignoring the fact I, I did put out a video years ago where I, I actually, even as a provisionist, believe that faith is a gift from God. Um, White claims that the other, you know, there's other early Christians who who called faith the gift of God as if that proves uh, his his view of Calvinism is existent before then. But is that true? I wanted you to speak uh, on that particular point. Um, yes, Layton. So uh, numerous examples can be found in the early church fathers talking about faith as a gift, that God uses human faith. He gives that as the vehicle, the gift to salvation. But Calvinists take those out of context. Uh, when the earlier authors said faith was a gift, it was in the context of everything being a gift right. from God. Life, breath, salvation, grace, faith, right. uh, allowing salvation. Um, I show how Augustine took those earlier Christian quotes out of context to use them in his novel deterministic view of God. Uh, because in the uh, Manichaean and Neoplatonic view, God must infuse faith in order to regenerate the spiritually dead person who has no ability to respond to God positively. No prior early Christian taught that view. No. <laughs> earlier Christians viewed faith as a gift, but it was, it was part of the whole package of God's gifts. Uh, faith was not divinely infused in, in Ephesians 2.8. Now, he knows the feminine-neuter distinction, and Greek grammarians understand the gift to be the whole package, salvation by grace through faith. He should know that. So here's what I tell my students. I compare it to me being a doctor, right? Um, you have the deadly Ebola virus. I'm a doctor. And so as you're dying, I give you a vaccine to cure you. So I, as the doctor, take the syringe with vaccine. I poke the needle in your arm, inject the vaccine. I save your life. I give you the gift of life. You're saved from death. The gift is the whole package. Me, the doctor, with the knowledge of the disease and how to treat it, the vaccine, the syringe, the needle, um, they're all there. But you don't get to keep me. You don't keep the syringe. You don't keep the needle. You do not get to break down the gift into its individual parts. The gift, again, is the whole package. You are saved from death by me vaccinating you through the injection. Um, Calvin is just abused 2.8, Ephesians 2.8, just like the Gnostics and the Manichaeans interpret it. Why? By trying to rip up the package into its individual parts. God infuses faith to the dead person as a gift. No prior early church father viewed it that way. Faith was not a divinely infused gift due to a human inability to exercise faith. Humans, we had the capacity to respond positively to God with our own human faith. So I, I think White should quit cherry picking the early church fathers on the word faith using a word search and actually read them all in context and what they're writing. It's, it's interesting on the video that I did on that one, I actually quote from John Calvin's commentary because he acknowledges that that the gift is not referring uh, to faith individually, but to the whole package, like you just said. So people who are intellectually honest, who know Greek, are willing to acknowledge that. Um, yep. and, and, and yeah, we, we would, of course, say, man, my next breath is a gift of God. Um, the, the, our ability to trust is a gift of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I can't, I can't hear unless He sends me revelation. He has to send me yeah. light. And we're responders. Yeah. By, by God's grace, we're responders. We don't initiate anything. We're responders. And so, yeah, He's giving us the gift of faith by bringing us the message by which we can believe. He, he talks about granting repentance even to the Gentiles. It doesn't mean He's effectually causing Gentiles to believe. It means He's bringing the message of repentance so that they may believe yeah. as well. First goes to the Jew and then to yeah. the Gentile. So when we understand these things, you don't have the Calvinistic lenses on, so you misinterpret not only Ephesians 2.8, but you misinterpret the first 300 years of writing uh, who, who speak of faith being a gift, which again, I, I get on my soapbox here, but it just seems to me, it just seems strange that Jesus would say, oh, ye, you know, little, ye of little faith, or you, and, and rebuking people for their lack of faith, if he's ultimately the one controlling whether they have faith or not, it doesn't make yeah. sense to me. Uh, it, it, it should be like, he, look, he should look up to heaven and go, God, why don't you give them more faith, you know, or something <laughs> like that. I, I mean, it just seems strange. Okay, and, th and this next clip, um, he, he seems to claim that uh, Calvinists are, are the true biblicists here. So uh, let's listen to this. 
Next paragraph. Because current Calvinist deterministic interpretations of Scripture passages are interpretations brought into Christianity through Augustine's Manichaean past. Excuse me. I read Romans 8 and 9 in Greek long before I ever had any idea of any connection between Manny and Augustine at all. So, did you even try to demonstrate? I don't get the feeling that Dr. Wilson can engage these texts. I really don't. Now, I, I know I heard Dr. White in his responses saying that we are all influenced by other people. We all have tradition. Yeah. Right? Right. Yep. Um, I asked my students, in fact, what is the, the most powerful influence on your theological views? And they'll say, Scripture. I say, no, <laughs> it's the people with whom you associate. That's the most powerful influence on what you believe. Uh, I was in 10 different denominations from Presbyterian to Pentecostal before I was 35 years old. Um, I did not want to be brainwashed because I know people influence. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think White has missed the argument. Um, you do not have to read Augustine. Uh, or anything about his interpretations to be influenced by those interpretations. They come through Calvin. So what I'd ask, uh, did White read Romans 9 in Greek prior to ever hearing the Bible interpreted deterministically by Calvinists? Are we that naive? His deterministic understanding of the Greek text is influenced by Augustine through Calvin's assumed determinism. Uh, even Manichaeans knew New Testament Greek, and they did their version of exegesis. They did it deterministically. <laughs> um, today, there are far better experts in Greek than White, and they do not share his understanding of Romans 9 through 11 and other texts. Why is that, I wonder? Well, because they don't have on their Augustinian Calvinist glasses as they read the scripture deterministically. Um, I think in that same session, session, the White admitted that we all are influenced by those who taught us previously. That I, I absolutely agree, 100%. But somehow, he's the sole exception. His rule does not apply to himself. He can exegete Romans 9 through 11 in the Greek without any foundation, just the scripture. Uh, the foundation of Augustinian Calvinism shows why Calvinists interpret those passages deterministically and why they are the only Christians in the entire world to do so. All of the world shares Augustine. Only Calvinists share Augustinian Calvinism's deterministic theology. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and it's the, the, one of the clips I remember him talking about looking into a well, um, and he talked about looking into the well and seeing your own reflection. Um, and the, he was, he was in a sense, critiquing us because he was saying that's what the provisionists are doing. They're looking into the well of history and seeing their own reflection. And, and it just made me laugh because I'm thinking that's exactly what I think he's doing. This is one of those question-begging arguments that I always point out that you can just turn the argument around and say the exact same thing back. That's a question-begging argument because we're accusing him of doing that. But, the, but here's the key difference. I, I, we have, a, have on our side reformed scholars who also see quote-unquote, provisionist in the well looking through history. In other words, when they look through history, Bavinck, um, Davenant, Calvin, um, all, all these guys that we've quoted for, from, um, Bettner, they, they see people who did not teach irresistible grace, who did not teach uh, uh, individual predestination of uh, individuals to effectual salvation. They admit this. So that's the difference between our two worldviews, is that, yes, we're both looking into the history, we're both seeing the reflection of provisionists, but we have other scholars standing next to us saying, yeah, you're right. Whereas he has nobody saying that he's right on, on that point. So um, it seems uh, to be uh, just a little um, one-sided, a little bit of a double standard there. But listen to this. Uh, yeah. this, this I, no, oh, that's, go ahead. Let me just say that, that that's exactly the point, Leighton. What's really amazing is we're both looking down the same well, <laughs> and we see the reflection down there, and we see one thing, and the Calvinists see another thing. How, how can that possibly be? And I think it's because they put on the Augustinian Calvinist glasses to see the same text. Well, in, in his review of Mothetes' epistle, 
uh, he actually says this this was a second century monergist. I mean, that's I mean, that's he sees a monergist when he reads Mophites. It's it's really amazing. Um, and, and he claims to to say that he's willing to go where the data is taking him. Listen to listen to this clip. The point is, I am open to where the data is going to take me. I don't have a thesis that I'm trying to find in the data. But I am certainly capable of recognizing when somebody else does. And that's what you have here. All right, Dr. Wilson. Do you believe <laughs> that he's willing to go wherever the data takes him? Uh, no. Uh, but I, I do think White believes it. Um, unfortunately, data is not transferred in the brain like a memory chip. Uh, White must process that data through his own Calvinist filter. So uh, a Calvinist truly wants the data, read my thesis with your filter turned off, take it off. Uh, I've not even used one provisionist scholar to defend my view about what the early church fathers believed on free will as they fought determinism. So White should not even use one Calvinist scholar to defend his view. I use facts, challenge White, produce the facts from independent scholars like I have to prove his statements. Um, I would theorize that data can never convince White when his theological presuppositions automatically reject that data. Yeah, you've got a lot of you got a lot riding on that. Not only just the the fleshly pride of trying to prove yourself right, but your entire systematic is imbalanced. I mean, having been a Calvinist for ten years, I, I recognize this. I struggle with this too. My, I, I helped to split my home church over Calvinism. And, um, and and my parents are not Calvinists, and I had a lot of really late night conversations with them, and it was very heart wrenching, as you can imagine. Um, and so, me and my older brother, we were Calvinist, and our whole family was pulling out of this little you know church of ours, and uh, that that's very very emotional and heart wrenching. And so, you yeah. know, years later, when I began to question my Calvinism, it was a good five or six to seven years even before I was willing to really come out and admit it, um, because of just that they kind of having to swallow the pride and going, Hey mom, dad, guess what? I, I, I think I might be wrong about this. Um, that's, that's hard for anybody to do. Um, and especially with somebody of the notoriety of, of James White and others like, um, you know, MacArthur or Piper or others who've kind of built their ministry around this sociological worldview. That's really hard for them to take off the lenses and be objective. And that's why it's so valuable for people like yourself to quote from, unbiased sources as you do over and over again. And as we've done here on, on, on our episodes, um, let, let's look at just another clip here. Who don't do church history have only read portions of Augustine city of God confessions, something along those lines, um, have not read all of Augustine and hence cannot be influenced by him. The thesis is, well, he takes Manichaean interpretations, Gnostic interpretations, whatever that means. Whatever that means. I have yet to find interpretation. I now have his own book. So maybe there's a whole section on the uh, exegetical methodology of the Manichaeans. I I'll look for that. Now, this is one we are, a fallacy we kind of saw previously. So talk about that a little bit more. Yes, another non sequitur does not follow logically. Uh, he commits a logical fallacy. For example, if Bob pushes Jill, who bumps into Bill, then Bob does not need to touch Bill to influence him. He does it through Jill. So Calvin's interpretation of key scriptures came from Augustine. You do not need to read one word of Augustine to be influenced by Augustine's pagan ideas syncretized into Christianity. You read Calvin, there's Augustine's determinism. So White's logic is an error. And so even though you may pick up a Bible um, and, and you're just reading the scriptures and you come to believe uh, in theistic determinism based upon the reading of the scriptures, um, when you begin to ask others and you're in, you're, you're in a, a surrounding where people are slapping you on the back and saying, yeah, that's right, that's exactly, it, that is an influence, um, versus people saying, no, nobody's ever believed that. No, that's not what anybody says. No, all the scholars say this. Then you're going to then you're going to back up and go. Okay, maybe I need to rethink what 
what Romans 9 is saying here. Um, and, yeah. and you're going to be influenced by that. In other words, there's influences all around us. Um, in, in the next section, uh, White goes to Clement of Rome and the, the epistle to, from Mothetes uh, to, to prove the, the Calvinistic interpretations of the ESCs, which I've done some responses to because he personally you know, brought me into the discussion. Um, and so I, I've discussed his abuse of the, the term elect previously, but I, I wanted you to talk yeah. on that as well. Yeah, um, White's uh, elect from Clem Clement, Clement of Rome is, is priceless. Um, he uses a strong man argument against me saying, um, something like Wilson thinks because Manichaeans used the word elect and Calvin used the word elect, then they must be the same. I never wrote or said that. I don't believe it. it's a straw man. Yet White turns around and uses the one word elect in Clement of Rome, trying to prove Clement, Clement believed White's Augustinian Calvinism. He merely assumes elect in Clement means Augustinian Calvinism's, Calvinism's Unconditional election. Nothing in the context suggests this. Priceless. So what, what about his exegesis of that epistle? What were your thoughts on that? It, it seems a little bit of hypocrisy, maybe. <laughs> um, yes, no, nobody else understands it that way who's not a Calvinist. They, they do not find it in that book. Well, let's watch a, a couple more of these clips. I, I think you'll see what we're talking about here. And now the Savior shown, Dykeson, Dykesos, able to save, even, Kai being used in the sense of even there, ta, aduna ta, those who lack ability. He has ability, they have the alpha privative, do not have ability. Okay, provisionist group. Okay, Leighton Flowers. Did you look that up? Why did I have to look it up? Next sentence. Next sentence. Uh, and having now revealed a Savior able to save even those creatures that have no ability, he willed, actually it's a continuation of the sentence, he willed that for both reasons we should believe in his goodness and should regard him as nurse, father, teacher, counselor. When you look at the Greek, it's, li it's literally uh Ebulethe pistuon hemas, pistuon hemas. He willed us to believe. Ha <laughs> ha! He willed us to believe. The same term, bulamai, that is used in Ephesians 1, it's used in Acts chapter 4, where God predestines according to his will. It's used in Ephesians 1. Like I said, this is the term, and we've already seen him clearly pulling from Paul. So here you have this second century writer speaking of God's divine will, willing us, pistuine, to believe. The very thing the provisionists say God doesn't do. Right there in the epistle to Diognetus. Unrefuted. I challenge anyone. Go, I put it in the article, go read how Wilson tries to say, well, we can't interpret it that way because of these other paragraphs. There is no argument given. None. None. Well, case closed. I don't know if we need, even need another debate. There's no argument, man. It's just obvious. You're, you must be wrong, Dr. Wilson. No, no argument. Uh, <laughs> whoa. So what has White done to us here? Uh, three critical points. One, even other Calvinists know better than to translate the passage the way White translated. Number two, White leaves out the rest of the sentence and the paragraph's context. Three, he adds an implied willed us to believe in Christ. Uh, that's not in the text. Maybe it's in his Manichaean text, but it's not in the Christian text. <laughs> He's not going to so, like that. <laughs> no, he won't. I'm sorry. I, I did not call him a Manichaean. I did not call Calvinist a Manichaean. Uh, I, I just talked about the text, okay? It's, you see what you want to see there, right? So let's go into more detail. Number one, 
Uh, other scholarly Calvinists do not translate it the way White does. Uh, if you look in the Anti-Nicene Fathers, Volume 1, where that is, both the editors and translators were Scottish Calvinists, James Donaldson and Alexander Roberts. Uh, why do even these scholarly Calvinists, much more so than White, translate it differently? So let me read what they say. Uh, the Savior who is able to save even those things that which it was formerly impossible to save, by both these facts he desired to lead us to trust in his kindness to esteem him our nourisher, father, teacher, counselor, uh, etc. So we should not be anxious concerning clothing and food. So White is at odds with his other Calvinists, uh, scholarly Calvinists. Uh, they do not find God willing us to believe in Christ. Uh, why is that? Well, because the text doesn't say that. <laughs> it doesn't say willed us to believe in Christ. White added that idea, and I suggest it comes from deterministic importation of Augustine. The belief trust is not in Christ for justification. It's for Christians. Christians, we should trust in God as being good to us as Christians. That is, God wills for us to believe in his goodness, his kindness to us. That is, God will provide our food and clothing. It's like Matthew 6, 25. And then third, uh, White stops his exegesis in mid-sentence to get his proof text. So let's do some exegesis of our own. Uh, the author says, by both these facts he desired. What facts? Well, he gives two facts. Our inability to save ourselves because of our nature, our fallen sin nature, and Christ's justifying righteousness for us as sinners. So on the basis of those two things, God desires us to trust in his kindness to us. And that exactly fits the prior phrases. Right. Uh, let, me, let me quote some. Uh, in ourselves, we were unable to enter the kingdom of God. We might, through the power of God, be made able. God did not regard us with hatred, nor thrust us away, nor remember our iniquity against us, but showed great long suffering and bore with us. End of quote. So the author's using Paul's Romans 8:32 argument. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously or freely give us all things? So likewise, the author writes, quote, so we should not be anxious concerning clothing and food, end of quote. So the whole context speaks to Christians, Christians, not God's inviolable will causing unbelievers to believe in Christ. Well, and, and if, that's solid. I mean, and that's, that's what exegesis looks like. Um, and and the, here's the clincher for me, Dr. Dr. Wilson, is that it's almost like he needs to get Bavink and Bettner and the five other or six other reformed historians who've come to their conclusion and sit down and go, you know, guys, y'all have concluded that there is no such teaching in the early church with regard to uh, God, you know, sovereignly willing for people to, to believe in him. Um, but here in the epistle of Mothetes, Look at this, this uh, this from Clement over here, where he uses these words, um, numbered among yeah. the elect. Th these do teach this. And so it seems like he needs almost to have a class for the other Reformed folks who are coming up with their conclusions that it's not seen in the early church fathers. Um, and in order to, to, to kind of combat this. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that he's not just questioning Ken Wilson or me. He's he's questioning the swath of even reform scholars who have read Mothetes, who have read Clement, and have concluded we don't find it here. It's just not there. Uh, it, that that seems to be the obvious there, and it seemed to me that your approach was more of a historical exegesis in its actual context, which is important. Uh, I think so. Uh, White's triumphant proof text is out of context. Uh, in yeah. fact, he does exactly. What he falsely accused me of doing with the early church fathers. <laughs> you know, it's like he pulls a big rabbit out of the hat by ignoring the context so he can focus on a few words and force them into a meaning he wants them to mean. But as you said, I mean, I have 80 scholars agreeing with me on the early church fathers on free will. Uh, they're not in my theological camp. Some are, are not even Christians. So when White's own Calvinist scholars don't support his abuse of this text, you have to wonder. 
So for him to say, quote unquote, there is no argument is, is to, re- it's really to ignore his own reform scholars. Um, and I, I did hear, yeah. by the way, um, I wanted to bring this into it. I did hear, by the way, um, yesterday in his broadcast, uh, White did finally say that he would debate you in person. Now, he made it sound like he said that all along, but I've listened to everything. I've never heard him say that he would debate you until yesterday. Um, but uh, he, he seems pretty insistent that you're going to be the one uh, to back out of the clip, uh, back to, to back out of the debate. So let's listen to this clip and you'll hear what I'm talking about. Key and God. That's what that's what you're being told. That is so radical. That it's astonishing and it's so full of holes that I'll tell you right now, once we get done with all this and once these other folks put out their stuff, we're going to be the ones going, so what happened to that debate challenge? Because it ain't going to happen. I already have hours worth, hours worth of errors in the dissertation. Okay, so um, something tells me once we put that all out there and you can go check these sources and you can look these things up and go, huh, yeah, that is what that says. Huh, wonder why it says differently in there. Um, Then all of a sudden there's going to be a reason why, you know, we don't want to. Yeah, look, look at the time. I got to go. Got to floss my cat. Um, That's that's not going to happen. Well, Dr. Wilson, do you uh, you do you have a cat? <laughs> uh, no cat or dog, but I do floss. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I just want to know if White debates. I've never seen a debate. Does he debate like he acts in his podcast? Uh, ad hominem arguments, straw man arguments, other informal logical fallacies, emotional rants, theatrical put downs. Um, he's willing to debate me. That's a good thing. I look forward to it when his schedule allows. Well, uh, having debated White, um, I will say he is much more cordial in person than he is on the Dividing Line program. And, and, and maybe that's kind of the the distance of the computer screen when you can, you know, be in a, your own office or whatever. And if you're just talking to a screen, it's a lot easier uh, to be a, a little bit more crass, if you will, or a little bit more rude. Uh, and, and And that's unfortunate. I think that we should be just as Christian in person as we are on the internet. Personally, I think that's important for us to, to maintain some decorum and professionalism in our discussions. Um, and so I also wanted to bring in some of the writings. We listened to a lot of the clips, but um, White's written some things and I sent you some links to those and, uh, and you had an opportunity to look at them. And on his blog on 421, he discusses the Gnostic Stoics and, and Irenaeus um, and I wanted you to copy. Uh, I wanted you to kind of go through that with us, and spe- specifically his um, his attacking your term, dupied. Why don't you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. So dupied is divine unilateral predetermination, not predestination. Divine unilateral predetermination of individuals' eternal destinies. And I, I explained this in the thesis, but I had to take it out because it was too long. But it's a neutral term. Why? Because I didn't want to use pejorative terms like fate or assume the biblical term predestination. Uh, when you're studying ancient religions and philosophies, uh, that can be anachronistic. So what Dupied means is a god or a god-type figure alone, doesn't consult anybody, does not consult foreknowledge, determines ahead of time which persons will be in paradise or heaven, and which persons are going to be in Hades or hell. And there's nothing anybody can do to change that destiny. So Gnostics, Manichaeans taught God unilaterally predetermined which persons would be in a type of eternal bliss or into Hades. Uh, And these uh, Manichaean and Gnostic Neoplatonic views, God had to infuse the faith in order to regenerate the spiritually dead person who has no ability to respond to God positively. That's dupey. So that is what Calvinism teaches. Um, they teach a form of dupey. Uh, I think they wrongly call it predestination due to Augustine's redefinitions. Um, and I could, don't have time to go into all that. But, but White seems to, to pick at a speck in my eye and leaves out the beam in his eye. How's that? Well, he talks about Irenaeus, 
but he refuses to tell you about Irenaeus' strong view of human free will and humankind's residual abilities to respond to God. Uh, as I explained, many scholars who I quote say that about Irenaeus. White's being dishonest with the data. You'll have to read your thesis for yourself because it seems you can't trust White to tell you what's in it. He has highly selective reading and highly selective sharing of information. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It seems that way for sure. Um, now, all scholars, at least the, the, the unbiased swath of scholarship in general, acknowledge that Augustine changed his theology. I think even White confessed yeah. that, that Augustine did change at, at some point there. So, so what's at stake really in this debate? If, if we're acknowledging, yeah, he changed there, then what, what, what matters about that change? Uh, great question. So uh, we need to know when and why Augustine changed his mind from his prior traditional Christian theology of 25 years. He changes it into a tulip style deterministic theology for the last 18 years. So that was the stated purpose of my thesis, pages one through three. Uh, prior to my thesis book, virtually all scholars believed Augustine changed his theology in 396 by reading the book of Romans and 1 Corinthians. My thesis demonstrated Augustine did not change his mind by reading Romans or any scripture in 396. Augustine changed his mind fighting against the Pelagians for rhetorical reasons in 412. He did it by misrepresenting prior Christian authors' views. He tweaked them. And Augustine changed the meaning of words. I'm not the only one to say that. He redefined them, as other scholars have demonstrated. Which really plays into the, the whole statement that we often say here, re repeated from Dr. David Allen, uh, that says Calvinists often have the same vocabulary but a very different dictionary. Um, and it really started with Augustine, it sounds like. Uh, and so yes. um, with, with that in mind, let me play a clip from his most recent broadcast that we have here. So how in the world can we be so incredibly arrogant as to think that he can control stars, that, that he is accomplishing his purpose in black holes and whipping massive stars around at a million miles per hour. But, but, <laughs> he can't control the will of man. He wants to, he wants to save, but he really can't unless man cooperates with him. Yeah. All right, well, this, this clip here, it really reveals to me the level that some people are willing to go to marginalize and mischaracterize our view um, as if we believe that God couldn't, even if he wanted to, effectually cause people to believe. Um, he, he even tells us that if mankind refuses to worship him, that the stones will cry out, which makes little sense if God is supposedly effectuating the wills of men in the same way that he would effectuate the, the rocks themselves. And so here, White concludes that God controls the stars but can't control the will of man? I, I wanted to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, <clears throat> false disjunction. Uh, it's like, have you stopped beating your wife yet? Um, he doesn't ask the right question. <laughs> there is no, zero dispute that God can control human wills like he controls stars. The question is, does God control human wills? <laughs> Uh, is the loving Christian God who invites us without controlling our wills, like all the early church fathers before Augustine taught? Or is he a control freak hypnotizing us, then drugging us with faith, though we must love God, like Aug the later Augustine taught? Um, arrogance and God's ability to control are not the question. False question. Uh, watching White discuss my thesis is much like watching fake news cover President Trump's daily COVID-19 <laughs> briefings. Uh, they only tell the propaganda talking points from China. <laughs> well, and here, here are some, uh, here's another clip uh, where White replies uh, to the many quotes I've provided from the other reform scholars, uh, ultimately saying that the, the, the early church fathers didn't affirm total inability, they didn't affirm irresistible grace that we've talked about before. And, and I want you to notice as you listen to this, 
Does he ever actually read the quotes in order to respond to them? Um, or does he even really address what they claim? In other words, does he address the findings of the Reformed scholars that we read from? And you be the judge. That is mentioned, and this is what illustrates something that I'm getting a little frustrated about, and so I wanted to address it today. I started responding to this stuff many weeks ago. And one of the things that I said, and one of the things that just people are ignoring, I have people on Twitter contacting me and saying, hey, how come you disagree with all these other people that said that um, these early church fathers believe this, and you're saying they believe something else? I, when I began providing background information, what, what were the provisionists doing? <laughs> Red herrings, just get to the dissertation. I mean, come on, you know, get the dissertation. This will blow everything. You won't, you won't have any ability to respond to any of this stuff. Just quit wasting time. Just get the dissertation, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff. They weren't listening. To pretend, and it is pretense, that there is a unanimity on some kind of dupied is heretical Gnostic Manichaeism, which, which was rejected by the church, is just absurd. On its face absurd. It, it so flattens out and simplifies the history that goes before the period of Augustine that it is indefensible. And yes, I will debate Ken Wilson on that. I've said that. But you cannot say, oh, they would have stood here because the argument wasn't happening yet. And then I illustrated that by looking at people, for example, like Tertullian, who utilize examples and language that later generations would find to be inappropriate and even heretical. But we don't condemn them because they were writing and speaking before those issues were actually addressed by the church as a whole. All right. So I've been anxious to get your take on this because this is kind of a theme throughout a lot of his responses. He seems to be saying that because the, a major debate hadn't ever happened in the early church over predestination, we just can't really know what they believed about this. Well, that seems like saying we cannot know what the early church believed on eschatology uh, because that argument did not exist prior to Eusebius or Tychonius or Augustine. Uh, sure we can. Uh, the ECFs did not write treatises on eschatology, but there is sufficient evidence to know some of their positions. Uh, likewise, uh, the early church fathers did not re write treatises against Calvinism. It didn't exist yet but we can know their positions on God electing through his foreknowledge of human choices, not by unilateral divine decree. Again, even Augustine argued this very traditional view for 15 years, and others before him did. Um, but White has refused to quote all those early church fathers I cited, and all of the scholars agreeing with me. It doesn't sound like he's, he, he's wanting to read them out loud to his audience, because if he reads Bavink saying it, and, and Bettner saying it, and Calvin saying it, then it would give too much credence uh, to, to, to what you're saying, because they're saying the same things. Um, and, and, if, yeah. and if they do accept the fact that the early church fathers didn't support tulip theology, then it, it, then it gives, a, a, it doesn't prove Calvinism is wrong. I don't think anybody's saying that. What it, what it proves, though, is that Calvinism wasn't introduced until Augustine, which makes it seem like there, especially if there's two interpretations of Scripture side by side, and there's been a debate which one's likely, and it's proven, well, the earliest church taught it this way, not this way. That seems like a pretty solid reason to consider the original uh, interpretation of the text versus the one that was introduced much later by somebody who didn't know Greek, by somebody who was uh, philosophically uh, minded, uh, somebody who was influenced, obviously, by Gnosticism and Manichaeanism. It just, that just seems reasonable, uh, yeah. if, nothing, if nothing else. And so um, I, I did want to highlight um, that your book, The Foundation of Augustinian uh, Calvinism, is available in Spanish, right? 
It is, Leighton. And in fact, this morning I received the German translation from Germany, and a Brazilian is working on a Portuguese translation. Well, praise the Lord. The word is getting out. And so that's that's what we're wanting. And so we can say what we want to about James White, uh, but he's helping us get the word out. And that's <laughs> he may not be doing it in the way we want him to, the way he treats us sometimes, but he's helping us spread spread the word. And so that that's something we should at least rejoice in. Um, and, and it's and it's likely that he's going to continue um, in his his attacks. And I think there's probably going to be some more fallacious uh, approaches to this, unfortunately. Um, but I hate to ask you this because I know you, you've had to endure a lot. And I know you're a busy man. You're uh, being in the medical field. Um, but would you be willing to return maybe for another interview down the road if, if we need to address some of these arguments? Um, I would. Hopefully it can be a quick segment and I don't have to listen to 15 hours of this. Um, <laughs> and, and you're right, White will persist. Uh, why? This is life and death for Calvinists. Uh, they're going to try to discredit this new information any and every way they can. Um, White will continue to try to pick apart at details of my thesis and wax eloquent on undisputed areas trying to regain credibility. Uh, but, you know, if he does come up with something reasonable and substantial, let me know. Well, we can do a quick second. You know, the, the first thing I thought, um, seeing his responses and how visceral many of them were, it, it may, reminded me of that old quote, me dost think thou protest too That's much. Is that the, the statement? Where, yeah. uh, where really sometimes you can tell when somebody has hit on a sensitive topic for somebody else because the, the reaction to it is so visceral and so uh, personal even. Um, and that's what it, it kind of comes across to me as, is, is that there's a sense in which, uh, especially Calvinists who are very diehard into their Calvinism, we've got, it seems like they're willing to stop at nothing to try to defend this perspective, even if it means maligning a person's, uh, you know, s scholarship, um, a person's character, like he's done with me. Um, and these kinds of things, which I think is so unfortunate. And, and I pray, and, I, and I'm, I'm serious about this, I do pray that as people watch this, um, they, won't, they won't see that we're promoting that kind of uh, Christian reactions to one another. I, I, I mean, what, what I will say is this, I, I really do believe that iron sharpening iron is important within Christian scholarship and within uh, the study of Scripture. I think that's so vital. Yeah. Um, and, and I appreciate that the fact that when people disagree with me, it pushes me to go deeper in the word. It pushes me to understand God's word more. And that's a good thing that can come from debate. The, the bad thing that can come from debate, I think, is, is showing younger Christians and possibly even unbelievers who are looking from the outside in that, that there is too much flesh and too much pride in the mix. And let's just be honest, with this COVID thing going on, we don't have any sports to watch. And so uh, we as men are looking for some competitions, I guess, possibly. Um, and so I, I don't know what you think about that, but uh, it just seems to me that there can be some positive aspects to this, but then there can be some side effects that aren't so positive as well. Yeah, I agree. Well, Dr. Wilson, thank you so much for your time. Um, you've, you've given so much to the church by writing, uh, and I know it, it's, it was over 15 hours of material to kind of try to dig through and sifting through all of that. I know that is, that is difficult, but I appreciate so much your time and your, your efforts in this process. Well, Dr. Flowers, I appreciate your program, uh, working with laymen to explain Christian doctrine. Um, I actually was impressed that you're teaching what pre-Augustinian Christians taught against deterministic systems and um, I pray the Lord bless your work. And I, I just wondered if we could pray for our brother, James White. Absolutely. I, 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 I was just thinking that, you know, praying for someone helps to soften the heart. Uh, so even though we may disagree, and so I think that's a great idea. Why don't you lead us? All right. Great. Um, our holy and majestic Father in the heavens, um, we are just in awe in your glory, your name. Um, thank you for what you've done uh, through your Lord Jesus Christ, bringing us into your family by your grace, through faith. Uh, Father, thank you for James White. Thank you for his work uh, against the non-Christian groups of Islam and Oneness Pentecostals and Mormons and, and others. Um, thank you for his commitment to you and to your holy word. Uh, holy Father, I pray that by your holy word and your spirit, you would continue to bring uh, James White into truth. Uh, we pray the same thing for ourselves, that we would uh, be open to truth 
so that the world may know that we are disciples uh, of Christ by our love for one another. Uh, we pray in the glorious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I agree with you, my friend. God bless you, brother. We'll uh, we'll uh, stay in contact, and uh, hopefully this will uh, just be a, a continuation of uh, learning more, not only about the early church fathers, but even more importantly, what uh, the Lord teaches us through his word about his character and his love and his provision for all people. God bless you, my friend. Amen. You too, Lady. Bye-bye.